Hello, everyone, and welcome to Metcalf Institute's 23rd Annual Public Lecture Series. I'm Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf Institute's Executive Director. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been fostering informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We take a variety of approaches to this work. We offer science training for professional journalists, such as our annual science immersion workshop for journalists that is happening this week. We offer communication training for scientists. We organize the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together science communicators from across the country to make science communication more inclusive and equitable. And we offer public events like this one. This year, of course, is very different for Metcalf Institute, as it is for everyone. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, this is the first time that we've conducted our annual science immersion workshop for journalists and our annual public lecture series virtually rather than in person. In at least one way, it's a good year for us to bring this lecture series online because 2020 is the inaugural year of our new annual Leeson lecture. This lecture honors Rob Leeson Jr., one of Metcalf Institute's longest serving advisory board members Rob has been an incredible advocate for Metcalf Institute and for many other environmental issues throughout Rhode Island. To honor that service and advocacy, a group of more than 140 donors came together last year to fund the annual Robert Leeson Jr. Lecture. Rob's goals for Metcalf Institute as a board member, and even now as an emeritus board member, have always been to increase national awareness of our work and to build our donor base. By endowing an annual lecture in Rob's name, which will be held each June as part of this annual lecture series, those donors have ensured that we will be able to honor Rob, advance his goals for Metcalf Institute, and bring inspiring speakers together to achieve the informed public conversations we seek. Thank you, Rob, for your dedication to Metcalf Institute's mission, and thank you to everyone who donated to make the annual Leeson lecture possible. Now, I'm thrilled to tell you about the inaugural Leeson Lecture. Originally, we planned for this lecture series to explore the practical implications of climate change. Specifically, we wanted to feature speakers who could discuss the ways we are already witnessing climate change and what we could expect to see with a global average temperature increase of two degrees Celsius, which is the global limit that the Paris Climate Agreement of 2015 was designed to achieve. While that topic by itself is a significant one, we all know that the novel coronavirus came into the equation earlier this year. At that point, as it became clear that COVID-19 would have significant effects on every aspect of our lives for the foreseeable future, we decided to expand the lecture series to look at how the pandemic might affect our responses to climate change. Over the last few weeks, the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Tony McDade, Rhea Milton and Rayshard Brooks, among countless other Black Americans before them, forced a national reckoning with anti-Black violence and the many ways that racism is structurally embedded in our society. This conversation is painful, difficult, and essential. So we decided to pivot our annual lecture series again to address the intersections of these three critical issues, climate change, COVID-19, and systemic racism. We acknowledge that we can only begin to scratch the surface of these intertwined challenges in a one week webinar series. However, we hope that these discussions will provide all of you with new insights, food for thought, and most importantly, ideas for action. With that very long introduction, I'm thrilled to introduce today's lecture and speakers. We chose to use the inaugural Leeson lecture to frame the conversations for this week. Specifically, we know that climate change has been happening and will continue. Today we ask, how might COVID-19 and the new broader urgency to address systemic racism change the ways we approach, communicate about, and act on climate change? We have an excellent panel of speakers to share their thoughts on the way this perfect storm might change our approaches. First, we'll hear from Dr. Jonathan Foley who is a renowned climate scientist, sustainability expert, educator, and public speaker. He is executive director of Project Drawdown, the world's leading resource for climate solutions. His work focuses on finding solutions to sustain the climate, ecosystems, and natural resources we all depend on. Dr. Foley advises governments, foundations, nonprofits, and business leaders around the world. He and his colleagues have made major contributions to our understanding of climate change, 
and sustainability in general about the world's resources with more than 130 peer-reviewed scientific articles. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Mijin Cha. She's an assistant professor of urban and environmental policy at Occidental College in Los Angeles. She's also a fellow at the Workers Institute, Cornell University, and a senior fellow at Data for Progress. Dr. Cha's research explores the intersection of inequality and climate change, particularly labor climate coalitions. Her current research focus is on a just transition or how to transition fossil fuel communities and workers equitably into a low carbon future. Dr. Cha has a law degree from the University of California at Hastings, as well as master of laws and doctorate degrees from the University of London, SOAS. And finally, we'll hear from Ms. Kendra Pierre-Lewis, a climate change reporter at Gimlet Media, whose coverage focuses on the intersection of climate science and its impacts on people. She previously worked for the New York Times, Popular Science, and Inside Climate News, where her reporting has chronicled how warming oceans have led to the collapse of critical fisheries in Northern California, how pollution associated with climate change is making people sick, and the links between wildfires and a warming world. Ms. Pierre-Lewis has spoken about her reporting on panels, television shows, and radio, including All In with Chris Hayes, Cheddar, and WNYC's The Takeaway. And with that, I'm very pleased to turn the mic over to Dr. John Foley. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for having us all here today and talking about uh, such important and, um, and challenging topics, but I hope um, maybe you'll find some paths forward today. Uh, so I thought I'd begin to um, maybe set some of the stage of this conversation, knowing uh, the other speakers will have far more wisdom than I ever will, um, but to just kind of talk a little bit about the nature of climate solutions um, and see how this might work. Uh, am I coming through okay, Sunshine? You seem frozen there. Is that... Are we good? Yes, you're good. Oh, okay, <laughs> suddenly nobody, I couldn't see anything. Okay, <laughs> great, okay, good. <laughs> I'm not just talking to myself, excellent. Okay, um, let me start sharing a few slides here and um, we'll walk through this and hopefully this will help um, spur some, maybe some additional questions and thinking. So uh, we're living in a, an incredibly unique time in all of human history. Uh, the last 50 years have seen more changes to human civilization than all previous human history combined. Um, the world's population more than doubled, the economy grew about sixfold, our use of fossil fuels more than doubled, our use of um, food roughly tripled, our use of water doubled. And so we're living in an incredibly challenging time in terms of thinking about the relationship of human civilization and the planet we need to survive. And also the, the issues of equity within the human population, both today, but also across generations. Not only how can we live better together now, but how can we leave a world worth inheriting for the future for everyone? And one of the biggest challenges to both equity and intergenerational kind of sustainability will be the issue of climate change because it's kind of rewriting the nature of our planet right now and certainly into the future. And I'm, I'm sure we're all aware of this, but just to make sure we're on the same page, uh, climate change is driven by human activities, uh, one of which is increasing the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, um, along with other gases like methane, nitrous oxide, and so on. But CO2 is the one we usually talk about the most. We started doing this back in the 19th century, and it's actually interesting the time where we started to increase the levels of CO2 back around the 1850s is also when the idea of climate change was first being explored by scientists. In fact, the first paper ever to describe the nature of the greenhouse effect and human activity was written by an American woman named Eunice Foote in 1856. And uh, it's largely been ignored by the history books for far too long. And um, uh, unfortunately, a, a man from uh, England instead got the credit for that work, but she actually published years before. So we need to uh, remind ourselves of that and celebrate the nature of her science um, and make sure the history books are corrected. So we've known about the greenhouse effect since it began in the 1850s, and here's what's happening. As we've been increasing the levels of these warming gases, the planet is obviously getting warmer, and along with that rise in CO2 has also been a rise in planetary temperatures, so far about one degree warmer than it should be. And uh, as Sunshine was mentioning, uh, we're heading towards maybe one and a half to two degrees, which is seen as kind of the limit 
of what we could tolerate on this planet before having truly catastrophic danger to human civilization. So this is a, you know, a, a very challenging picture, one that you know, we see all the time and we hear a lot of very negative stories about our future when it comes to climate change. But I wanna pivot just right here, right now and not go into the doom and gloom kind of show because uh, we often hear too much about how this seems hopeless. And I would argue that it's absolutely not hopeless, um, that we can actually build the future we want. We absolutely have the ability right now to begin to stop climate change and build a better future. And all it really depends on is us making some hard choices. But the tools we need to address climate change are in fact here today, and most of them are very, very good for most people on earth, and would be very wise to embrace them. Uh, that's what my organization does, just a little background. We work on what we call drawdown, the moment in the future when greenhouse gas levels stop climbing, they level off, and we begin to bring them back down again and help restore our atmosphere to a more natural state, or at least prevent future more catastrophic climate change. And uh, we do a lot of the science on this. We do a lot of uh, kind of crunching of numbers to see how big different solutions could be. And we try to share them with the world so people can kind of see what would work best, what would it cost, and how can we put it together. Uh, just to set the stage for some of the conversation today, I just want to give a little primer on how we might think about climate solutions so we can inform that with some science. Uh, if we think about climate change, the best place to start is with the atmosphere, because that's where the physics happens. This is what we have to work on. And the atmosphere is responding to two big things. One is we humans are adding pollution to the atmosphere every year from a whole variety of different activities. These things that you see down below, including burning fuel to make electricity, our food, agriculture, and land use practices, our industry, our transportation, buildings, and other kind of uses of energy, those are burning things like carbon and adding methane, carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, fluorinated gases, all of those greenhouse gases are being released into the atmosphere from about these six major economic activities. So that's kind of the source of the problem. Uh, that's what we humans are doing and dumping pollution into the sky. But the atmosphere also has another side to it. The atmosphere, in fact, naturally has a removal mechanism for some of these greenhouse gases, uh, and that's thanks to nature. It turns out about 40% roughly of the greenhouse gases we put in the atmosphere every year are almost automatically removed by nature, uh, primarily by forest on land, but also by oceans. And so those kind of what we call sinks, the things that remove greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, that's really helpful because about 40% of the pollution is immediately taken away. That's fantastic, but the bad news is it still leaves about 59 to 60% of that pollution each year. And that's why it's still building up year over year, accumulating over time, warming the planet. Uh, so that's kind of the big picture here. We have our pollution on the left and we have nature's kind of sinks or removal mechanisms on the right and the middle is what's left over, and that's the real problem. But to achieve uh, what we call drawdown, this moment when we can stop uh, climate change from getting worse and begin to reverse it, we have to do two big things, and then I'll argue for a third, which might connect to some of the bigger conversation today. Obviously, the first thing we have to do is really stop the pollution from where it starts, uh, bring these sources ultimately to zero. Uh, that is, begin to reduce the emissions from electricity, from our food sector, from industry, transportation, buildings, and so on. And it's kind of handy to remember for the first five of those areas, again, electricity, food, industry, transport, and buildings. That's 90% of our pollution is just on five things. It fits on one hand, so it's pretty easy to remember. We also though have to work with nature and maintain these very helpful kind of carbon sinks that are being provided for free by the natural world. But those will only still be there if we can help protect what's happening on land and what's happening in the oceans. That is helping uh, forest remain intact and healthy, uh, healthy ocean ecosystems out in the deep ocean, but especially our coastal areas like mangroves, coastal ecosystems and so on. And if we're really clever, once we protect what's already there, maybe we can even add a little bit to these natural sinks in our agricultural practices, or maybe even with like machines that could suck carbon out of the air. 
But when we do this, if we can stop the pollution and we can help keep the health of the natural world, then we can begin to reverse climate change and suck more out of the atmosphere than we put in. And that's when we hit that moment of drawdown and begin to stop climate change. So we've spent the last couple of years analyzing hundreds and hundreds of different solutions to climate change, trying to quantify how big are these solutions that we have really right now in the real world. Not stuff in a laboratory, not in science fiction, not in Elon Musk's brain, but things are actually there right now that we could actually use today. When we do that, we find this basic diagram here summarizes what we find, but we find that there are lots and lots of solutions, but they fall into big clumps, kind of big categories. For example, up here, I show the kinds of solutions we have in the sources, that is reducing pollution. Again, in those five big areas, like electricity. You see here, we can see shifting production. That means not burning coal and gas, but using solar, wind, and other things to produce electricity, but also energy efficiency. Those circles, the bigger the circle means the bigger the solutions we have right now. And those ones that have two circles, the, uh, the inner and outer circle represents the range of possible solutions that we think are possible today. So we have a lot of solutions around electricity. We also have a lot around food and agriculture, especially things like food waste, changing our diets, protecting forests and farming more sustainably in industry, transportation, and buildings, and they all have a repeating pattern of, let's be more efficient on one hand, and let's change the way we do things on the other. On the sink side, we have a lot of solutions as well, especially on land, where we can help protect forests that naturally soak up carbon, but we can also maybe put our working lands, like croplands and pastures, all those agricultural lands, could also be changed to maybe enhance their ability to store carbon too. You'll hear about this as called uh, regenerative agriculture. There are also ideas about what we can do in the oceans. A few of them are in practice today, but probably many, many more. And then maybe with some engineering to, uh, and technology plays. The one I want to leave us with, though, is one that I haven't talked about yet. Um, one, we stop pollution. Two, we support nature and carbon sinks. That's all great. But our work often points to a third category, which speaks a bit more to this question of equity and justice today. It turns out that the science is very, very clear, is when we improve society, we improve things around equity and justice, we find enormous climate solutions there as well. But of course, these are things we should do anyway, regardless of climate change. But it's really nice to see that equity solutions can also be climate solutions. So far, we found immediately solutions that help improve the gap between how women and men have access to health care and education is a major climate solution. But also we found working with like indigenous communities and how they protect their landscapes and their forest is also a climate solution. Interestingly, when you look at a forest that's healthy and maintained by an indigenous community that's been there for centuries, those forests are almost always more diverse more productive and able to store more carbon than the forest around them. So it's very interesting. There's kind of three um, big levers to solve climate change. One, of course, cut down the pollution. We have to do that to support nature. But third is really supporting equity and justice around the world for the most disenfranchised people isn't just a good idea for humanity. Of course that is, and we should do that always for that reason. But it also turns out it helps us address the question of climate change too. Another big finding of our work is that it's not too late to address climate change. It may appear to be politically and maybe culturally, but in terms of the physics, in terms of the economics, in terms of the engineering, we absolutely can still stop climate change, but we have to start now. We've already waited too long for three decades or so, not really acting thanks to people deliberately delaying and deliberately trying to derail these efforts. But if we really get started and make bold moves now, we can actually make a huge difference. We just can't afford to wait. 
Now, the best things we can do, and I'm sure a lot of folks will ask, like, well, what can we do to help? Well, I think forums like this are a big help. We all need to learn more from each other, from different perspectives, different backgrounds, different lived uh, ways of life, and so on, and share those and be willing to challenge our own assumptions and biases and really come together and find solutions, especially from people who haven't had as loud a voice as others have had in the past. But I would argue we also need a better and bolder kind of vision and leadership. Um, a lot of the leadership we have today isn't about making us better, it's about making us worse. It's not about bringing us together around a common goal, but it seems to be about dividing us so somebody can make money or clicks or get votes. And I'd rather see a kind of leadership that challenges us to be the best who we can be by challenging us with a better version of ourselves, a better version of the world. I'm reminded that you know, Martin Luther King didn't go around America saying, I have a nightmare. He talked about a dream, a very hard dream that we're nowhere near completing yet. But it's a dream I think we all know deep in our guts, deep in our bones is the right dream. And he invited all of us to come together and try to build that better world. And we're beginning that journey still. And I hope we can do the same with climate change as well. Let's bring us all together and realize we can build a better world for all today and tomorrow. And I'll wrap up by just reminding us the future is not written yet. It is still up for grabs. We get to write the future. No one else does if we take the risk and accept the responsibility of consciously creating a future that we want. So with that, I'd just like to you know, step aside and see if there may be some questions and go on to the rest of the panel. But uh, hopefully helps kind of frame the kinds of areas of action we need to take in order to address climate change from the very technical but also those are deeply intertwined around the human condition and equity and justice, which are certainly top of mind for all of us today. Let's Thank you, John. Um, there we go. Okay, so we have a couple quick questions, not, not quick questions for you actually. <laughs> um, first, there's a, a technical question here. Um, uh, so Denise asks, do we have any sense of whether there's a limit to how much CO2 can be absorbed by natural sinks? So our oceans, forests, et cetera, constantly trying to balance out what humans are emitting, or is there a danger of them being completely saturated? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes, these uh, so-called sinks are um, not guaranteed. Uh, if anything, climate change and the continued human degradation of nature uh, may make those go down just to the time we would actually like them to go up. Uh, which is kind of uh, very, very scary. So far that doesn't appear to be happening, but it's something that the computer models and all of our understanding of global ecosystems says might be possible. So that's one of the biggest worries that not only are we changing the climate, we're also simultaneously doing things like tearing down rainforest, we're performing really bad agriculture all over the world, we're degrading our coastal ecosystems and we're making the oceans warmer and less diverse and less rich with life. Uh, we need to stop that. So uh, it's a very big worry that those kind of carbon sinks aren't guaranteed, in fact, could go down. Uh, also, there's a limited ability of, um, you know, we humans are tapping into ancient, deep geologic sources of carbon. That's the coal, the oil, the gas, things that should not be in the atmosphere. Those are intended to be in rocks. Those are supposed to be down in the geology, not pumped into the atmosphere. And our ecosystems are kind of overwhelmed with that kind of additional carbon in the air. Um, the biosphere uh, on land and ocean can only absorb so much. Our agriculture and planting trees can help, but they can only absorb so much and for so long. And there's no guarantee they'll be there forever. So the real solution has to be to stop that pollution to not be pumping coal and oil byproducts into the atmosphere. That has to be the number one solution. Carbon sinks are the second. Um, a bad but maybe helpful analogy is like if your bathtub is overflowing, the first thing you should do is turn off the faucet, then we pick up the mop. And the same thing's true of the atmosphere. You can't just mop the pollution out of the atmosphere every year while the faucet's running at full force. We've got to do both. Great, thank you. Um, there are a lot of wonderful questions coming in here that we're gonna put a little hold on so that we can move on to the next speaker and we can come back to these a little bit later. So um, next, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mijin Cha from Occidental College. Dr. Cha. 
Thank you, Sunshine, and thank you uh, to you and the Metcalf Institute for having me here today. I apologize for being late um, and not finding the Zoom link, but I'm very happy to be here with you now. And um, I'll just talk very briefly, and hopefully uh, we'll get more into it in the question and answers um, section. Uh, so as Sunshine mentioned, my name is Meejin Chai. I'm an assistant professor at Occidental College, and my current research agenda is really looking at this idea of just transition. Um, it's an idea that has become more and more popular uh, and as people are talking about it more, but I think it's really important for us to take this moment to kind of really think about the idea as a concept and kind of how it would apply to our current moment. Um, so what is just transition? Um, just transition is an idea that came out of the labor movement originally actually in the 1970s from a labor leader named Tony Mizaki, who was head of the Atomic and Oil Workers and Chemical Workers Union. Um, and basically what Mizaki was saying was that as we move away from toxic industries, we need to take care of the workers that have been working in these industries. Um, and that idea has developed since then to really think about what are the negative economic and social consequences that will come from decarbonization and how can we address them? Now, of course, the idea that there are negative economic and social consequences does not mean that we should decarbonize by any means, right? But building on what John has said before, the, we need to really think about the equity concerns um, because we need to think about what are we transitioning into? So when we say just transition, what are we really transitioning into? And part of it, of course, is an energy transition as we transition from fossil fuel based fuel, um, sources to renewable energy and clean energy sources. But more than that, we're thinking about as we transition into a more just, more equitable world. And that's why the part of it that says just, right? It's not just an energy transition. What we're really trying to build is a just transition that really recognizes that fossil fuel communities, low income communities have really borne the brunt of our extractive economy. And as we transition away, we need to make sure that those workers and communities are not only taken care of, but that they're able to thrive in a low carbon future. Um, and I think the next question that naturally arises is why does it have to be just, right? Why, why can't this, I think uh, points to a broader tension in the climate movement between people who think we should just really focus on greenhouse gas emissions reductions and those that think that all of these things are intertwined. And in fact, the truth is all of these things are intertwined. The things that are causing income inequality, that cause racial injustice, that cause all of these inequities are the same things that are causing the climate crisis. If we think about this idea of an extractive economy, you know, environmental justice groups talk about moving from an extractive to regenerative. And what that means is that it's a recognition that the extractive economy is extracting resources it extracts labor and extracts people. So it extracts resources, as we know, from when we drill and mine oil, um, coal, oil, and gas. It extracts people when we think about things like incarceration and unemployment rates, unemployment rates and unhoused people, and extracts labor. So what we're not talking about a lot is that renewable energy jobs don't pay as much as fossil fuel jobs, and they have a lower rate of unionization. And it's important to point that out because it doesn't have to be this way. And that is the point of just transition, right? Is that as we create new jobs, as we create a, renewable, a clean energy future, we don't have to replicate the mistakes of the past. We need to stop extracting labor. We need to pay people a decent wage and the paying the, a decent wage is fundamentally a part of climate policy. That is the point of just transition, is that these things that people try to say are, are, are irrelevant or uh, apart from climate policy are actually fundamental to climate policy. So things like in inequality, that is fundamental to climate policy. Addressing inequality is a climate issue. Um, addressing fossil fuel extraction is also a climate issue. But then also thinking about what world are we creating is a climate issue. So we don't want to be recreating the, we don't want to be doing the mistakes of the past. We don't want to be recreating the same extractive exploitive practices. And that is why we need a just transition. So what does this look like? Um, and especially given our current moment. So earlier this year in March, a group of us put together an idea for green stimulus. And the idea was that as we see this post COVID world, we know that there will be, well now we, I think we are officially in a recession and the economic consequences of the COVID crisis, I don't think we're actually understanding how deep they will be. Um, and we have multiple challenges at the time, at the moment, right? So state and local entities will lose a ton of tax base and resources, we'll have, we have extremely high levels of unemployment, and we also have the unequal nature of the COVID crisis. And this is also similar to what you hear about climate change, that these things are not great equalizers, right? They're great magnifiers. 
So in fact, COVID is disproportionately impacting communities of color because of underlying health conditions that are part of environmental racism. So it's not that we are all equally impacted by the COVID crisis, right? And similarly, we, wouldn't, we are not all equally impacted by the climate crisis. Your ability to ad address and mitigate climate change, the, you're sorry, your ability to address the impacts of climate change depend on your resources. So for instance, folks that live on the coast that can afford to move will move. And the people that can afford to move will be still living on the coast and be displaced. So it's not that climate change will impact all of us equally. What it will do is in fact magnify these inequalities in our society, which is another reason why we should have these social concerns are a part of climate change. So back to the green stimulus, sorry. Um, the idea was that we were going to need some kind of stimulus plan. And now we've seen three iterations of stimulus. Um, but if we're going to be investing in economic recovery, we should be investing in the economic recovery of the future. So instead of doubling down, for instance, on fossil fuel infrastructure or propping up oil and gas companies, we should be transitioning and using that money and that funding and that investment to invest in renewable energy, in the energy efficiency, infrastructure repair and upgrading, public transit, uh, worker-owned cooperatives, many local manufacturing for clean energy products, all of these things are things that we are doing at some level now, but we should really be ramping up. And the idea of a green stimulus is that if we're going to be spending trillions of dollars, we should be spending trillions of dollars investing in the economy and climate of the future. Um, since the time that our green stimulus was, implement, was introduced, um, parts of it have moved in different ways. Um, the idea now is also, is there a way for state and localities to have a green stimulus um, and as I'm sure all of you are well aware, the political challenges are not small um, because the unemployment rate was not as bad as the, as the Trump administration has had and Republicans had anticipated. There is you know, not a lot of momentum or an appetite to have another stimulus package. Um, I think that as, we, as states start to reopen and the economy doesn't recover, there will be a recognition that we will need some kind of stimulus. Um, and our idea is there are 92 policies that are basically building on what we are doing now on, at a much bigger level. And we know that money will be spent, money has been spent as part of the stimulus. And it is really up to us to make sure that any future funds that are invested really invest in low carbon infrastructure, low to zero carbon infrastructure, protecting workers and communities and protecting frontline communities. Um, and for those that are maybe perhaps unfamiliar, we, frontline communities are those that we say will be hit first and worse with the impacts of climate change and also not have the resources needed to address the challenges that will come from the climate crisis. These communities are overwhelmingly communities of color and low income communities. And they're also these communities that you're seeing now that bear the brunt of police brutality. Um, so my, I'll just talk a little bit briefly about the current current moment. I feel like COVID is the current moment, but also this, um, what we're seeing people in the streets is also currently happening. And there has been a discussion about what does this have to do with climate change, right? There are, again, um, folks that say, okay, we should put a pause on climate advocacy and we should really be focusing on Black Lives Matter and police brutality. And the truth is that, again, all of these things are interconnected. So when we say that we want to protect frontline communities as part of climate change, protecting frontline communities means we address this issue of police brutality. Right, so if we think about what needs to happen, demilitarizing police, shifting resources from the police departments into communities of color, that is, a just, that is the beginnings of a just transition, right? So as we start to decelerate militarized and over-policing, and we start to reinvest those resources into communities of color and low-income communities, that is a transition. And that is a transition that is needed for frontline communities. So if we say as climate advocates that we are, interested, where we are focused on frontline communities, we are ensuring protection of frontline communities, we need to really think about what does that mean? And this moment has really highlighted how these ideas that we used to think as separate as climate, from climate are actually integral to climate justice. There is no climate justice without racial justice, and there is no racial justice without addressing police brutality and over the state-sponsored violence. Um, so I'll stop there. Uh, I'm happy to answer more questions in, um, that may come up, um, but thank you again for having me here, and I apologize again for being late. Thank you, Mijin. Um, and no need to apologize. We're very glad to have you. Um, so I, I wonder, th there's so much that you just said that I'd love to dig into, but, but one quick kind of clarifying question, I wonder, is 
Could you explain how the green stimulus plan that you and others put forward is the same as or different from the Green New Deal? That's a great question. So if we think about the Green New Deal and the People's Bailout and the Green Stimulus, all of them can coexist and all of them are complementary. Um, the Green New Deal as introduced is basically just a framework. Um, if you hear Representative Ocasio-Cortez talk about the Green New Deal, um, there's, it's not prescriptive in terms of policy, but the idea is that, again, you want to decarbonize, you want to protect workers and communities, and you want to protect frontline communities. And so the Green Stimulus really abides by these three guiding principles and is part of a Green New Deal, um, but is not obviously the Green New Deal, but it, we could think of it as a down payment on a Green New Deal. Great, thank you. Um, and one more question that I'll ask before we move on to our next speaker, and that comes from Matthew. He asks, what are some of the things each of us can do on an individual level to help ensure that we continue on a path toward a just transition? That's a great question. Um, on an individual level, I think, you know, there's a recognition that these issues are structural, right? So we need structural change. So the best thing that individuals can do is push for structural change. Um, I think being, whatever level of comfort you have. So joining demonstrations that are happening now, calling your congressperson, um, always voting. But as we're seeing now, we need more than votes, right? It helps to have different people in office making decisions because we need different decisions to be made. But we need more than that. And I think that what you're seeing now is the manifestation of an engaged population, which I think is so exciting, right? Democracy takes work and we have to do the work. Um, so I would say that, you know, instead of there, there is the individual, what you can do in terms of reducing your carbon footprint and all of that, but really what we need is structural change. So I think the best things that individuals can do is do the work to push for structural change. Great, thank you. thank you. Okay, so we're now going to move on to our uh, final panelist, Kendra Pierre-Lewis, who is a climate change reporter um, currently with Gimlet. And Kendra, you can take it away. Hi, um, thanks so much for having me, Sunshine, and thanks everyone for turning up. Um, I do have a presentation and I am going to hopefully share it. Um, there we go. Does this work? Is this working? Okay, perfect. Um, and so I'm a journalist. And so obviously the thing that centers me the most is telling stories. And something that I think speaks to this present moment sort of generally is that the question I get asked the most is how do I come up with ideas for stories? And the question I get asked at least is how do I tell a story? Um, and while sometimes an idea is so powerful that it's sort of the structure of that idea becomes the article itself, most of the time it's on me to decide. And I bring this up because how we tell stories matter. Um, we're in this moment now where there's a lot going on between COVID and climate change and the protests that are happening. And we know all of these things are newsworthy, but how we're telling them isn't always the best. Um, as a journalist, I think that our industry has too narrowly focused on the facts, the who, the what, the where, the when, the why, that leave out important context and nuance. Um, we are not, as an industry, I think, careful enough with their language. Um, you know, journalists, Freedom of the Press is one of the only institution, only other non-governmental institutions inscribed in the Constitution because we're supposed to uphold democracy. Um, we're supposed to hold institutions accountable to citizenry. But if you look at reporting from the first week of recent protests, you can see that journalism failed. Um, it focused on the violence, but not where the violence was coming from. Um, early reporting on COVID had sort of that same kind of, um, had a tinge of attitude that while it was happening in China, it was happening in Italy, it couldn't happen here. It did happen here. Um, we're living with that happening here. Um, news organizations and journalists have biases that need to be interrogated. And I think in many cases, they've also been institutionalized to such a degree that every detail of a story can be correct, but, it, but the narrative that it creates is incorrect. Um, journalists and the newspapers they write for have values, which is how you can end up with a headline like Buildings Matter Too, which recently graced the Philly Inquirer. Um, that's how the default voice the de when they're talking about police violence, the default is the use of passive voice because there's an, an increasingly embedded deference to authority and to the status quo. Returning back to the subject matter that I know best, which is climate change and climate science. Um, as an industry, we focus pretty narrowly on the climate science and not what that actually means in people's lives. It's a critical loss of context. Um, 
the Tom Cotton piece, which drew so much criticism recently, has among prominent white journalists ascended into a conversation about the need for a marketplace of ideas. But these conversations allied past the fact that those ideas are frequently about whether or not black people's lives have, have value. Um, Gabe Schneider, who's a journalist of color, said in a recent post on Medium, prominent white writers constantly obscure the racially coded nature of their criticisms. They don't want to directly admit that they disagree with a large number of their black colleagues. Um, and at the same some of this, I think, is just, as I alluded to earlier, like, some of it is intentional, I think. Some of it is just a reflection of people's viewpoints. Some of it is just coded into the language of how journalism is and how we've always done things, so this is how we continue to do things. Uh, because of tight deadlines and habit, we can rely on linguistic tropes that reinforce problematic or recent ideas. Um, so to that end, I'm going to use my time today to walk you through what goes through my head when I'm working on a story, and hopefully from that and the resulting conversation, we can get some insight into our present moment. And also, hopefully, I can learn how to, yes. Okay, so these are words and phrases that I avoid using. Um, trapped in poverty, for example, is prescriptive, not descriptive. Um, it's saying that people exist in a certain circumstance. Um, I don't use, a, I try really hard, I sometimes get editorially over rules to avoid using the phrase natural disaster because a natural hazard is a hurricane or a wildfire or a tornado. A disaster is when a hazard meets the human population and that is a result of choices. It's a result of policies and it's a, it's a result of a lot, you know, choices to put people in those situations. Um, and then I often will avoid using the passive voice because when you write, you know, there was one recently that was like tear gas went off in a protest and they like they twisted themselves backwards to imply to not just say the blunt truth, which is a police shot tear gas into a group of protesters. Um, on that note, when I'm working on a story, the whose stories are we choosing to tell? How are we choosing to tell it? Is the narrative pitying or disempowering? And what relevance does this have to the reader's life? Who is the audience? Um, that's kind of a really important question to me. And to me, I generally assume the audience is someone who is intelligent and well-intentioned, well, well -intentioned, but um, ignorant. Uh, and that's okay, because I'm ignorant about lots of things too. I don't know how cards work, for example. Um, and so um, one of the stories that I'm going to take you through, this was the first story that I ever had go viral, I guess. And it was called, This is what America looks like before the EPA. And the reason I bring up this story is because um, so many times people have asked me why I did the story this way. And this is around the time that Scott Pruitt was um, elected or nominated to be the head of the EPA. People knew that Pruitt didn't like the EPA. And the conversations and the headlines were such that it was completely structured around whether, like, oftentimes the headlines were like, he rolls back regulations, but that doesn't actually, that's, that's actually a value-laden statement because if you like regulations, then him rolling it back is bad, but if you dislike re regulations, then him rolling them back is good. I mean, from the literature, though, that when you sit down and ask people line by line about clean air, clean water regulations, people on balance are in support of those regulations, but the way we write about it often pushes people into their polarizing corner. And so the story was to kind of get people out of that corner and just ask the first question, why did the EPA exist in the first place? And I was helped in this capacity because the EPA in the 1970s when they launched had commissioned a whole bunch of um, documenting photographers to take pictures across America to sort of chronicle the baseline before they did anything. And that's how you get evocative statements like people from Pittsburgh saying that like, it used to be that you, if you wore a white shirt to work in the morning, it would be gray by lunchtime. That's not a reality that most of us who, you know, sort of grew up post EPA or post invention of the EPA even have a context for. And so really the whole point of this piece was to put people into this context, to give people a little bit of history. So then we can go back and have that larger conversation about regulatory rollback. This was actually really old research um, that we did in, um, by old, I mean like five or six years that had never been reported about before. And actually the researcher on that story when I called her, like I'd heard about her work through the grapevine basically, when I called her to ask her about this research, she said that oftentimes she had reported, she had talked to reporters many times and they'd always written about the fact that communities of color are disproportionately polluted, but the segregation bit never makes it to the paper. And that to me was telling, it was like there's a story there. And also, um, to me anyway, the narrative is very different. Like this, like one is this empowering of, you know, poor black and brown communities who are being tranced upon. And the other is a bigger narrative, which is it's screwing all of us, whatever your feeling about racial politics is, right? Um, and this was, I actually had to 
fight pretty hard to get this through. Um, yeah. So another one is the story that I did on Iceland and fishing. And the big thing that you need to sort of know just broadly is because of climate change, uh, fish are moving away from the poles and towards, or away from the equator and towards the pole. They're like on the move. And the story was told through the lens of Iceland, mostly because I was going to Iceland for other reasons besides journalism. Um, and I could have told the story as through this lens of Iceland as a passive actor in all of this, the story of this thing happening to them in a distant place that most people in the United States won't go to. Um, but that isn't the story that I told. And I didn't tell that story for a few reasons. One, because um, going back to that comment I had is what does the reader need to know? What is the context that the reader needs to take away from this story? And to me, while the story of fishermen losing certain fish in a place that I will never go is sad on its face, that there are real geopolitical and social context to what this means broader. And so that I thought was more important to a reader than another sad story about like climate change. And so, um, you know, these are just kind of excerpts from it, but like the big, as fish cross political boundaries that can create um, a platform for conflict, right? And like that was like, I had never heard of the cod wars before I did this story. Like there are all sorts of ones that, you know, they didn't join the European Union because of this. Actually, it was an accident, but somebody actually died because of this. Like these are the things that happen if you broaden your lens beyond trying to tell a, a trope of a story and actually try to focus on what it is that people need to know and what matters. Um, this graph, so the thing that I, the thing that was really important to me for people to recognize is that Iceland on balance in the near term will be fine. They're, they're losing fish, but they're gaining fish because as I said, they're moving to the poles. And so they will, and they have the money and they have the capacity to adapt. But I feel like Rashid was like a unicorn, he was great. I called him for other reasons. And it turns out that he was from Sub-Saharan Africa and he knew all of the extra context. And this was like another thing that I kind of had to push to include because it was outside the realm of what we sort of expect from traditional science storytelling. But I thought it was really important. Um, one thing that I don't know how I feel about it now is that like I had originally, like he had this quote about like, and that's how you get climate refugees. And it's been shortened and condensed to cause people to move. And to me, that feels like a euphemism. And I kind of feel like, wonder if I should have pushed harder to contain the original language. Um, but the other thing about that is that again, it's reinforcing the idea that like, even though you're not from the tropics, this has repercussions for you where you live, right? Like people might show up in your community um, where you live. And in the back of my head was the understanding that most Americans don't eat much fish. And when we do eat fish, we only eat it in restaurants. So I'm telling a story of a foreign land they probably won't visit. And I'm telling a story of a food commodity they probably don't eat. And so I needed to find a way to make it more relevant to those, those readers. Um, this one, circling back on COVID, um, is I did this in March. And the first thing when everything shut down was record, because I'd done a lot of disaster research, was recognizing that everything you do to fight fires revolves, involves communities and involves groups, large groups of people. And everything we do to fight COVID means not having large groups of people. And so it was really important for me to do this story and to do it early because I wanted people in fire country to start thinking about it. Um, I kind of think maybe I did it a little bit too early, honestly. Um, circling back to kind of like racism, um, this would, I actually knew Reverend Barber a bit before, of Reverend Barber a bit before I did this story. And interestingly enough, Al Gore's people are the one that, um, invited me down but when I got there it just became very apparent to me that that the story was Reverend Barber and that's what I filed but also I was really thought through like these are this is a community that is fighting that is making a lot of noise and so it was really important to me to not show them as passive recipients of the, of pollution but as act um like active participants in their in democracy and in change and in in shaping their re lived reality and it was also really important to me because we were in Greensboro to bring it, and because we, uh, we know the disproportionate impact of pollution to communities of color, to bring it back to that history of Greensboro, which I did down here. And so like, you don't have to read the whole thing and we're kind of showing time, but the, the kicker is that the church that this protest was happening in um, 
was where um, was attended by at least two of the Greensboro Four who did the Woolworth counter sit in. And so we really wanted to get that in the piece. Um, and actually, when I was in Greensboro, I made a point of visiting the museum that they've since made out of the Woolworth store where that protest happened. And I feel like for me, all of this is about constantly bringing back to people the things that they need to under know in order to understand and really contextualize in their life the pieces of facts that I'm giving them. And I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Kendra. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask you just one question before we get to the whole group here, because we're short on time. And uh, this comes from Bernardo, who says, um, many newsrooms have moved incredibly slowly, unwillingly, and badly toward more diverse newsrooms. Others are still openly racist. Can you share good examples of newsrooms or publications that are working from the right type of anti-racist structures, either because they started that way or because they restructured the newsroom in that way? Um, I can't, <laughs> I wish. Um, <laughs> I guess you just uh, didn't answer that. <laughs> I, I do want to say that the, the newsroom where I know a lot of journalists of color uh, exist <laughs> and who overall are like, yeah, we have problems, but don't feel beaten down by it and don't seem to and I can't speak to every person in that newsroom because I don't know every person in that newsroom. And I can't say that they're coming from an anti-racist lens because I don't think they are, but I do think they're coming from a better place than a lot of newsrooms are, is ProPublica. Um, and so much so that I tweeted that there was one um, media organization that I'd heard nothing bad about and it wasn't ProPublica and I'm not gonna name it because they're not really news. Um, and the number of people who slid into my DMs to ask me if it was ProPublica was actually somewhat absurd. So I feel like there's some consensus out in the world that it is at least a less hostile workspace for journalists of color. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna quickly now transition into another question that I feel is really um, something that's relevant for all of the speakers. So I encourage all of you to weigh in as you'd like to. I appreciate that uh, Kendra just brought up this, this question or this issue of narratives and the, the fact that how we conceive of our stories and how we tell our stories and the language we use is really essential. And I think that this, is, this crosses over all of the things that each of you has talked about, um, whether it is about how we are engaging people in conversations about solutions, um, how politicians are talking about this, how researchers are talking about this. So um, I wonder if maybe we can start with with John or Mijin, if either of you have responses to that, and then Kendra, I encourage you to jump into with other thoughts. Um, maybe Mijin can go first if you like, or uh, I don't sure. know how I can do this. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I, I always feel a little torn about this because I know I think for the reasons that Kendra pointed out, narrative is so important. But I also get really frustrated, like we got all this pushback about like, well, Green New Deal is really, the, the, the term is toxic. And I'm like, you, you, I don't care. Like the point is that we have to have this like massive climate. And you're kind of seeing it now when people are like, defund the police is really confusing. And I get a little bit stuck in the like, um, if your concern is over the term, you're not really dedicated to the cause. Um, but I do think, but then on the other side, I think narrative is really important because I think it helps people see themselves in the stories. So for instance, it's easy to say, that police brutality is an issue affecting somebody else. And I think that is an area where narrative can be very, very necessary and very effective in saying this affects all of us and hopefully engaging people that would otherwise be unengaged. Yeah, uh, I think Mijin said it very, very well. Um, and Kendra, of course, too. So, and I'm a scientist, so my thinking of this is probably less uh, sophisticated than the other two panelists. but. Uh, narratives matter, words matter a lot. And um, one of the things, even in the more narrow kind of sciencey realm of things, we've spent so long talking about climate change as a problem without offering solutions. We use rhetoric that's scary uh, and hopeless, which, you know, sometimes it feels that way and sometimes it kind of is. But that literally, the neuroscientist friends tell us that, you know, that fires the amygdala in our brain and we get this fight or flight reaction. So no wonder there are people who deny the obvious science of climate change because it scares the hell out of them. It's a natural human reaction. We have to help people move beyond that or to run from it and or to uh, fear that like, well, we can't do anything. So we go straight to doom and we're fighting in this landscape between denial and doom. 
And that's not very helpful. It doesn't actually solve a problem. And that's on just physics and chemistry. And then when you get into the even trickier issues around race and equity, justice and politics, oh my gosh, you know, language matters a lot. And I, I think um, Ejen's comment of like, we can get very uh, hung up on the language and, and we should, I think it do, does matter what we say and how we say it, it definitely affects how it's heard. But at some point you're like, I don't care what we call it. This is right and this is wrong you just do it. You know, so I, I, I share that frustration too. But at the end of the day, I think um, history teaches us that words matter and how people hear things and how d people, unlike ourselves, and you know, I, I'm a 50 something white guy in America today, so I was born with a lot more privilege than I deserve. And I need to, you know, personally, and a lot of us on this call probably have to really step back and say, wow, I hear things a certain way that is totally different from people who have a very different lived experience than myself. So I think we, we all deserve to step back and need to step back and hear what we're saying and how we're saying it. And I really appreciate Kendra's comments on this um, and Mijan. So I think that's some real wisdom here. Kendra, did you want to add anything more to this or? Um, no, but funnily enough, I guess just one thing, which is I saw something earlier today that actually said defend the police was the perfect slogan because it tells you exactly what people want. And also it, takes it out of the realm of like it puts it into like a budget category which is like we can take the money that we're putting in this place and put it somewhere else which is what you need to do to address some of the systemic issues behind like crime in this country and like inequities is like take that money so i go like it, i often feel like when someone says they don't like something it also sometimes helps to think about who is saying they don't like it right Absolutely. Well, and this leads to um, a, a suite of questions that we've received from some of our, our viewers that are all related basically to leadership. Um, so this is, there's no silver bullet answer to any of these questions, but, uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on them. So um, in various versions, this question is, um, how can we develop better leadership um, when we're clearly seeing the world going in a direction that is not providing the leadership that we need to act on climate change and all of these intertwined problems. Um, and, and Bernardo puts this really nicely. He said, how is the future up for grabs when we don't have the political or economical influence to grab it? And there are several other people who are interested in this, this challenge of, um, of leadership and making sure that there is um, an opportunity for many people to be engaged in that leadership. So do any of you have thoughts on that? I do. <laughs> um, one of the things I think we do, or that journalists do that is actually a disservice for people is we focus so much on federal and national leadership and we don't focus enough on local and municipal leaders and there's so much that you can do on a municipal level to adapt to climate change or there are things that if enough communities are demanding that they can get from the federal government to act on even if the federal government doesn't is not ordinarily amenable to and we don't sort of talk enough about how much local policy gets scaled up on the federal level so like yes like voting is not enough as jonathan said but there's a lot that needs to happen not just on a federal scale and there's a lot of communities that have people in power or people in leadership who have the ability to act on stuff now, if you press them on it, or those are positions where it's also much easier to get rid of people, right? <laughs> I don't mean kill, but I mean like, um, God, not elect, not reelect. <laughs> Sorry. Understood. <laughs> Mijin or John, other thoughts on that? Um, I'll just say quickly that um, I, I agree that we should also remember that elected officials can become unelected and most of them should be unelected. Um, and I, I, you know, I think it is challenging uh, to think about the, pro the scale of problems that we have and the solutions are like, you should vote or like call your congressperson. And it seems really like the solution does not fit the scale of the problem. And I completely agree. But it is also true that, you know, anecdotally, people, staffers in Congress, and I totally agree with Kendra that state and local gets no attention and is really where LA is a great example of all of that pressure, you know, resulted in money hopefully being taken away from the police budget. Um, but, you know, staffers are telling me that they hear from like only lobbyists and people who have money. So when they get 50 people to call in on one issue, it like changes everything about what they think. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I was talking to some folks about how you build power, folks that work on the ground. 
And um, this woman said something that I thought was really powerful where she was said that when you get people to stand up for each other, that is when you start to build power. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing here now is like when you get people who were not aligned, aligning, not just aligning, but standing up for each other, that's really where you start to build real power. Um, and I, I, I think maybe we're in a moment where this could, something like this could happen. I guess um, adding to that, I totally agree with uh, Michelle and Kendra's points. Um, but I, 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 first of all, there, there is leadership around the world. There's more leadership today on these issues than there's ever been. You just have to go look for it. Um, most of the important climate actions that are needed in the country, for example, don't happen at the federal level anyway. Uh, the most important climate policymakers in this country are about 100 people you've never heard of. They're going to be the public utility commissions, the people who design uh, mass transit in LA or San Francisco or New York or whatever. They're your zoning board officials, people you know, kind of you don't even know. Uh, and it's often at the municipal, state, county level, but it's also corporates, it's Wall Street, it's entertainment, it's academia, nonprofits. There's enormous leadership. And uh, with apologies to uh, Kendra, our colleague from the media, um, I think the biggest danger to the United States today isn't a military industrial complex. That's what we used to be worried about. It's the political media complex. We have 24 hour news cable shows, we have social media, and we have politicians who are, who are playing a game show with our democracy. And wouldn't the world be better off if Donald Trump didn't have a Twitter account? Wouldn't we be better off if we canceled all uh, cable news shows completely? Just, they're gone. I want Walter Cronkite or the new version of that, hopefully not just a white guy. How about 30 minutes of actual news once a day? That's it, that's all we really need. But no advertising. This should be a service to the country. After all, we gave the airwaves to corporate media and they're making money off of it and clicks off of it and treating journalists like crap in the process and the rest of us like crap. That system is broken and we can't fix democracy until we fix media and we fix the political process. And they're, in, they're feeding off of each other, tearing us apart. We have a whole industry of politicians and media icons from Tucker Carlson or whoever on the left you might not like either who were trying deliberately to divide us with misinformation and hatred. And we have politicians who are feeding into this too. We can't solve problems with those bozos on screens and behind podiums. We have to just move beyond that. That's not gonna happen right away, but I just say, don't give them any oxygen. Don't pay attention to it. Look for where there's actual things going on and it's gonna be somewhere else. Uh, these problems are never going to be solved in Washington or in cable news. Anything inside the Beltway is just toxic right now, whether it's, you know, I, I think we have to look elsewhere for leadership because it's certainly not going to come from there. So, um, Kendra, as a reporter and not a pundit, I'm going to give you the, the last comment here if you'd like it. Uh, yeah, I'm not a political reporter. So. <laughs> I'm not going to say that I fully disagree with Jonathan. Uh, there's, there's some truth there. Um, but yeah, I think, I think one of the things ultimately is that whatever your talent or whatever your skill is, it's going to be needed in addressing climate change. Um, and the question is just you figuring out how do you take that skill set and apply it to this problem. Well said. Wonderful. Well, thank you all of you for joining us today and um, sharing your time with us. Thanks to everyone who tuned in for this webinar for sharing your time with us. I'd also like to thank Tammy Burnham, who's been doing our closed captioning today. And of course, all of the donors who made the, the Leeson lecture possible. We are, um, we'll be doing this every year from now on. So we look forward to many more wonderful conversations. If you have not yet registered for the rest of the lectures that we have scheduled this week, please do so. It's really a fantastic um, collection of speakers and topics. So with that, thank you again, Kendra Pierre-Lewis and Jonathan Foley and Mijin Cha. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>